Um, shifting a little bit into mechanics and like the training load, I mean, that's a big one. I mean, for the longest time, you know, I remember you know, you'd hear lift heavy or lift big or go home or something like that. I mean, you like, you know. Go heavy or go home. Yeah, that's it. Like, what does the science say about that? Like, you're, this is, you know, you've really contributed to this, this area um, about do you need to train heavy to get your gains? So this is an area that I've done pretty much a one, so I've changed my opinion on it. so many things that, you know, that I learned as an up-and-coming sports scientist um, and that were treated as dogma, you know, in textbooks that my views have, uh, in certain respects, done 180 and nothing can be characterized more so than loading. So I had always thought that if you're doing anything over 12 to 15 repetitions, it's basically glorified cardio and that, you know, it's just muscle endurance, you're not going to gain muscle. Um, the literature is now compellingly shown. I, I just, there's so much literature on the topic. Our lab has uh, done quite a bit of research as well as many others. And it shows that you can gain um, muscle, similar amounts of muscle, regardless of the loading across a wide range of loading spectrums, up to 30 to even 40 repetitions, which is a long, that's a long set. Um, and that's at the whole muscle level. Now there may be, and I want to really uh, emphasize, this is not, this is still equivocal, there may be some muscle type, muscle fiber type specific benefits to doing light loads for type 1 fibers and uh, type 2 fibers for heavy loads. Uh, I, I, if you're asking me my confidence in that literature, it's, you know, modest at best. Uh, but I can't rule out that that would be the case. But when you're looking, let's say, at MRI data or ultrasound, which we've, we've used extensively, really shows no difference. And I'll tell you what I think is a quite funny story, looking back. But Stu Phillips uh, had published a study circa 2012, and he went on uh, social media, it was Facebook at the time, and it was on untrained subjects doing leg extensions. And it showed that there was no difference in whole muscle hypertrophy between 30% 1RM, which is like 30 reps, versus 80% 1RM, which was like 8 reps. And I remember it as clear as day saying, still, come on, this is untrained subjects doing leg extensions. That's, they get jacked from doing spin cycling. That was, I think, my exact quote. And I said, I'm going to do this study and train individuals. You're going to see... Um, there's going to be no uh, no question the older individuals are going to need the heavier loads to get those highest threshold motor units, the type 2 fibers into play. And um, lo and behold, I carried out that study in no difference. <laughs> it was really eight crow. And, uh, and since then, there's just been so much evidence, not only in uh, just across the spectrum of populations, untrained, trained, older, younger, men, women, uh, it, it really, any and every population has been extensively studied. And it really is a beautiful thing because it provides so much flexibility and options uh, to carry out resistance training. And it's particularly, I think, beneficial uh, for issues like training through injuries. So if you're training through injuries, you know, heavy loading can be contraindicated. And also particularly for the older individuals because joint-related um, issues, as you know, uh, as people get older, they get osteoarthritis and other joint-related issues where heavy loading can be very uncomfortable for them and perhaps debilitating. And so it's kind of contraindicated. And they can use lighter loads. Now, the caveat to this is, is that the lighter loads have to be taken with a high degree of effort. So they have to really, if you do not extensively challenge your muscles, meaning that the last few reps are difficult to complete, uh, you're not going to achieve gains. So the, when I talk about light loads, it's not this, um, you know, taking pink dumbbells and just, you know, doing some lifting. Okay, I, I stop. Uh, you must challenge the muscle. So heavier load, when you lift heavier, it, just innately you're going to challenge the muscles uh, regardless because the weight is already heavy. Um, with lighter loads, the first number of repetitions are very easy to complete. And if if, if it's easy to complete, you're really not doing much for, for challenging. And, and this goes back to a survival mechanism. So the reason that the body, I think this is important, because the reason that the body adapts to strength training is survival. The reason that the body adapts to anything is through a survival mechanism. And uh, if you are not challenging it in a way it is not accustomed to being challenged, 
uh, it has no impetus to adapt. So the reason that you will get these adaptations in strength and power and hypertrophy, muscle endurance, uh, bone density, etc., is because the muscles and bones, etc., tendons, ligaments, are being challenged beyond their present capacity. And so as you get stronger, then you have to push past that and challenge them more. So the, so the big take home for lifting lighter, which is what I tend to do, is to get fatigued, right, when you're doing it. And so it often means more reps, um, which I enjoy doing. I've done both, and I do find for me, um, I like doing the lighter lifting and more reps versus doing heavier and fewer reps. And I also notice I'm less likely to injure my wrist um, if I'm doing, if I'm doing, now maybe that wouldn't, if I was doing things like proper form and all that, maybe it wouldn't be such an issue. But what about, um, so you mentioned with the lifting lighter and you know the important thing of basically fatiguing yourself, right? Like you can't just do a couple and it's like, you know, compare that to lifting heavier and doing a couple, right? Mm -hmm. um, this, this whole idea of training till failure, and um, what does that mean? Do we need to train to failure? Is that important? Yeah, so failure, for an operational definition, would be the inability to perform another repetition with proper form. And uh, we carried out a meta-analysis recently on this topic, and the bottom line is, is that, and that's kind of the go hard or go home philosophy, you know, that's the bodybuilding mentality of go hard or go home. Every set needs to be taken to failure. Um, the evidence does not indicate that's the case. So certainly you need to train with a high amount of effort. Uh, but to take, uh, all certainly to take every set to failure is not, not only is it not, doesn't show any benefit for hypertrophy, it actually showed a small detriment for strength. So with strength, stopping a couple reps short of failure seemed to have better effects on uh, maximizing strength than training to failure. I, again, there are some limitations to that research. How much of that, uh, does that mean that if you train to fail, you won't maximize your strength? I'm not necessarily on board with that, but that is what our results showed. Um, I also would not dismiss the fact that for very high level, let's say you're very close to your genetic ceiling, that it might make the need to go to failure, at least on some of the sets, uh, more relevant, uh, beneficial. We don't have good, this is purely speculative on my end but I can see uh, at least the logical rationale where it makes your challenge, it's a way to challenge the body in a way that it is not used to. Uh, I will tell you that in when I coach bodybuilders, uh, I generally incorporate some failure training, but another area where my view has shifted, maybe not 180, but probably 90 uh, degrees, where uh, I used to be the go hard, go home dude who every set need to be taken to failure, and now, most sets within two to three reps of failure. So there's a concept called the repetitions in reserve. And a, a zero, it's the RIR scale, repetitions in reserve. An RIR of zero means you're at failure, means you cannot have done another rep. There's zero reps left before you go to failure. An RIR of one would mean that you, have, you could have done one more rep, and at that rep you would be at failure. From the literature, although we don't have a definitive way of making you know, estimates on this, but I, my own interpretation of the literature is somewhere between probably one to three rep, RIR, reps from failure, would be needed to um, promote optimal adaptations. You can still see adaptations, particularly when you're uh, more in the newbie stage, in the early stages, um, below that. But uh, one to three, I think, is a good general recommendation to, uh, that's necessary to see adaptations. Again, then you start getting into the weeds, getting into the nuances. Uh, for the gen pop, I probably would say that's always going to be effective and you probably never have to go to failure uh, for the goals of most gen pops. For bodybuilders, high-level athletes, perhaps some failure training, the last set to failure on some of your exercises at least. And again, you want to get into the weeds, probably using your single joint and machine-based exercises would be more appropriate for failure, let's say, than squats, or a biceps curl, a lateral raise, a leg extension. Um, they're gonna be, first of all, there's less issue of injury, because when you're going to failure, let's say, in a squat, and you're, if you've ever squatted, yeah. and you're in, that, you're in the hole and you're trying to push out, there's a greater 
potential for injury, you get, certainly you're going to need a spotter in that regard, or else you're, you could be stuck and you can have problems. Or a bench press, where you're trying to do that rep, if you don't have a spotter, you're, that that uh, bar is stuck to your chest. Whereas if you're uh, doing, let's say, dumbbell curls or lateral raises, you're, at the very least, you're not going to be really torched after your sets. You're going to be able to come back strong. So these are just general, um, it's speculative on my part, but I think there's good logical rationale behind these things. And I do want to say that uh, an evidence-based approach, so I do want to promote, uh, one of the things I, I look, my biggest hobby horse in life is to promote the importance of evidence-based practice. It is not simply deferring to research. Research is never going to tell you what to do, or virtually never. It's going to provide general guidelines, particularly in the applied sciences like exercise and nutrition. It will get, get you into the ballpark, uh, you know, give you general uh, strategies to use. You then need to take this to the individual. What are their genetics? What, are their, what is their lifestyle, their stress level, their sleep, their uh, nutritional status? All of these things together. And then, of course, goals are going to enter into it. Um, so developing a program from the research me, uh, means to understand the research and then to use your own expertise in combination with the goals and abilities of the individual. Right. Um, with the um, designing the, the training program sort of aspect, we're kind of, I mean, sort of talking about this, this and, um, you know, the training till failure, it sounds like, you I, I, that that's pretty clear um, for me. Like you know, maybe the bodybuilders that's a little bit more important. Uh, but for most people, getting within one to three reps until failure kind of answers the well. You get a lot of questions about how many reps do I need to do? How many reps do I need to do? It sounds like it, it depends on the person. And when you start to feel that fatigue when you're getting close, you know, right? Like so, that's kind of what I'm thinking for Correct. myself. Um, resting between those reps or between the sets, or which way is it? The resting intervals, um, between sets. it's between the sets. So um, yeah, so so basically when you're getting ready to do another set, like how many sets do you need to do, or how long do you have to rest between them? Is that important? Yeah, so again, this it's on a spectrum and it depends on, it. so when I talk to my students, they'll ask me questions and I say, you know, pretty much any applied question you're gonna ask me, I will answer with an it depends, because, um, Within broad spectrums, you can get, if you're doing a very minimalist routine, you can make gains. So uh, if you're saying, is it important? It starts to become more and more important, the more important it is to you to maximize your results. Uh, if your goal is just to build some muscle, gain some strength, a very minimalist routine, I mean, training an hour a week, let's say two days, two half hour sessions a week can give you very nice, most people, very nice results, provided you're training hard. Is that going to, if you're looking to be a bodybuilder, is that going to, or you're going to step on stage? No, I, I would say with 100% confidence that is not going to be sufficient to optimize your gain. So volume has been shown to be a driver of hypertrophy. Again, we've done uh, original research on this. We've done um, made a nap, made analytic work. And uh, there is a dose response relationship up to a certain point. It is individual specific as well. So some people respond better to, or respond well to uh, lower volumes. Some people need more volume to maximize their results. Um, hard to study individual, resp individual responses, but these are kind of general um, insights that we glean from the literature. But I would say, as a general guideline to optimize hypertrophy, you want to be somewhere between 10 to 20 sets per muscle per week. Now that's not going to be able to be done doing two half hour sessions per week. But um, we recently published a review paper called No Time No Lift. It's open access. Uh, you can maybe post on, on the, this uh, podcast the link to that or, or show the uh, image of the study. But uh, we basically kind of looked at what is your minimal effective dose? Uh, and that was roughly around four sets uh, per week, uh, per muscle per week, which again can be done two, th maximum, you know, three half hour sessions, two to three half hour sessions per week. Uh, you can get very nice results. Um, and I think get probably, for most people, the majority of gains in that period of time. And then if you want more, 
you're going to have to devote more time. 